Good morning and happy Sabbath. I'd like to thank the church again for inviting me to come. I look at the clock and uh, this time it's a bit different. The last time I came here, I saw I could only speak for 20 minutes. I was <laughs> you know, trying to rush through. But now it maybe has more than what I had prepared. <laughs> but uh, praise the Lord for this opportunity to share with you the Word of God. The Word of God is full of uh, teaching for us for even this modern time. Do you believe in that? Yes, amen. Uh -huh. Okay, we have been studying about the great controversy theme. Isn't it? So today I'd like to start with uh, the great controversy from the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, we can all uh, memorize that. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The last verse of chapter 1 says, and God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. But Genesis 3 came into the picture. Sin entered into this world, and it shattered God's original plan. And it broke God's heart. Because what he had pronounced to be very good, now... It's not good at all. Death rules the world. Everywhere we see brokenness, sickness, hopelessness, loneliness, and fears. But praise the Lord. Chapter 3 did not end with just a sad story, but it ended on a positive note. God did not let the sin problem to continue. God has a plan. So Genesis chapter 3 did not stop at the disaster, but God took up the responsibility to repair and to restore. We know as Adventists that he set his healing machinery into motion immediately as soon as sin entered into this world. You know, since then, the whole universe is focused in restoring human race through all the successive generations. And this ministry of restoration is also what we call the ministry of healing. And it was also the focus of the ministry of Jesus, if you read the Bible carefully. Now, let us take this journey to the time when Jesus was walking upon this earth. We are all very familiar with this story. The first one is John chapter 5, verse 17. There was a lame man that was lying at the pool at Bethesda. Uh, Bethesda, some people say, B, the SDA. <laughs> okay. Uh, interesting name. Uh, so there was one lame man that was lying there at the pool. And you know the story, you know, Jesus was walking by. There's so many sick people. But this was, what, there was one particular one that was really bad. Okay, he has been there waiting for the pool water to move. For many years, probably. But he was the most hopeless case at that, uh, at, at, beside the pool. And we know what happened. Jesus went to him, asked him whether he wants healing or, you know, and asked him to take up his bed and walk. Well, the interesting thing is, following that, in chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus said, My father worked hitherto, and I work. Okay, of course, we know the context is talking about uh, Jesus healing on the Sabbath. Okay. Uh, but what work is that? What work? So what, what work Jesus was talking about? What work was he doing? You know, Desire of Ages, page 207, directly commented on this verse. It says, Heaven's work never ceases, and man should never rest from doing good. 
Okay, this is a comment on the verse that we have just read. Okay, John chapter 5, verse 17. My father worked even until now and I work. So what, what work is this that Jesus was talking about? That heaven had never ceased working since the world fallen into sin. That is this work of healing, isn't it? It's the work of healing. It's the work of restoring another human being. Look at the immediate context again. Jesus was healing the lame man who was lying there paralyzed. And Jesus says, My father has worked since the beginning, and I continue his work. And the Spirit of Prophecy told us that this is heaven's work. And this heaven's work had never ceased. And the counsel is that man should never rest from doing good. In other words, a ministry of healing is equivalent to doing good work. You know, you don't need to be a doctor. You don't need to be a nurse. Of course, if you are, praise the Lord. Okay, you can do much more. But you don't need to be a health professional to do the ministry of healing. Because ministry of healing is equivalent to doing what? I have given you the answer. <laughs> good work. Brothers and sisters, it is good work. Story number two is something that is really probably one of the favorite uh, miracles that I, I have for me because uh, uh, you can say I'm an eye specialist, so you know, uh, this is something really close to my heart. John chapter 9. <clears throat> John chapter 9, there Jesus encountered a man who was born blind. A man who was born blind. We are only going to focus on just an aspect of this uh, story. Okay? Uh, maybe another day I'll share with you uh, my thoughts about this miracle. But very interestingly, you know, actually Jesus was escaping <laughs> from, from these people trying to stone him. And then you know, Jesus and the disciples, as they walk out from the, uh, you know, or escape from the temple, then Jesus' disciples, uh, you know, saw this man who was lying there, you know, a uh, blind man. Then the disciple asked Jesus, whose sin caused him to be born blind? Very interesting uh, question. Oh, we, we always say, oh yes, you know, those days, you know, the people think that, you know, if, if someone is born defect, you know, we are having a, a congenital defect, then he, he must have, have seen, you know, even maybe in the womb. Or maybe he had his father's or his mother, or maybe even his grandparents have seen. But do you know, sometimes we also behave like that. <laughs> You know, when we look at someone who is suffering, then we say, ah, you know, he must have done something wrong. That's why, that's why you know, uh, become like that. And then that's why it leads to this and that's why it leads to that. You know, our human minds always tend to try to rationalize and explain things. And many times we actually behave like the Jews in the past. We are trying to actually explain, but at the same time justify something that had happened. And in that process, actually push down another fellow human being. But I would like to draw your attention today to what Jesus answered. You know, Jesus answered and said, it was not because of this man's sin, nor his parents' sin, but that the words of God should be made manifest in him. There we have read just now in our uh, scripture reading, verse 4 and 5. Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night 
cometh where no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. That was his answer to the disciples. Is there any link? Jesus was asked the question, whose sin is this? Jesus said, neither. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him. And then Jesus added a comment and says, I must do the work of the Father. He who has sent me, he had given me a work to do. I have a duty to accomplish because the time will come when no man can work. And Jesus said, and I want you to see carefully here, Jesus said, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Okay, I put these two texts in parallel. Okay, we have just read John 9, verse 4 and 5. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, look at another parallel. Uh, if you don't think it's parallel, just you know something that's similar. Matthew 5, verse 14 and 16. What did Jesus say? You are the light of the world. And then Jesus continued to say, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Can you see the similarity? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And Jesus also said, You are the light of the world. Are we followers of Jesus? If we are followers of Jesus, then we would do as Jesus did. Jesus said, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And so today, are we in the world? So as long as we are in this world, we are the light of the world. Or at least we're supposed to be the light of the world. If you are the light of the world, then you should let your light shine, so shine before men that they may see your good work and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Jesus, when he was on this earth, he did the work of the Father. He did good work. He went around healing people. He went around calling people back to the uh, truth. That is our work. Good work we are called to do. And these good works are the ones that make us like the light that shines in this world of darkness, in this world of darkness. So what work again? Again, it is a work of healing. Again, it is equated with good work. And it is this good work that will light be as if like the light that shine out. That's story number two. Now we shift gear a little bit to story number three. Some of you have, may have heard me sharing this. I hope you, as you hear, it will deepen your impression. Acts chapter 3 and chapter 4. You know, children are very familiar with this story. You know, it's the story that you sing. <laughs> and even as an adult, you know, every time you sing, you, you find the joy, you know, the joy that makes you jump up. You know, that you want to praise the Lord together with the whole multitude on that day. Peter and John went to pray at the temple at the ninth hour. And there was a certain lame man who was, again, from his mother's womb, was carried there, and they laid him there, and they laid him there at the gate that is called Beautiful. Friends, on that day, something beautiful is going to happen. 
what's going to happen. And it is so beautiful that even until today, we sing about it. And this man was sitting there asking for alms from those people who entered the temple. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter into the temple, he stretched out his hand asking for alms. But Peter and John, fixing their eyes upon him and said, Look at us. Verse 5 says, He gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lift him up. Immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And so he, leaping up, stood and, and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising the Lord. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And then they knew that he was the one that was sitting there asking for alms. They were filled with wonder and amazement of what had happened to him. Verse 11, And now the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, and all the people ran together to them to the porch which was called the Solomons, and they were all greatly amazed. And when Peter saw that, he responded to the people and said, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Why do you look so intently on us as if we are we have done some great things by our own power or godliness? In short, Peter took up the opportunity and continued to preach a beautiful sermon on that day. Now, as they spoke to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them and being greatly disturbed that they should preach in Jesus' name, that they laid their hands upon them and put them into custody until the next day. But, friends, verse 4 says, Many have heard and believed. And the number of men that believed on that day was 5,000. They were asked, Why you do these things? By what name? What power? Who authorized you? Peter stood up, filled with the Holy Ghost, and says, Rulers of Israel, if we were judge this day for a good deed that is done to a helpless man, and by what means he has been made whole, let it be known that it was by the name of Jesus Christ that this man stand before you whole. Verse 12 says, There is no other name under heaven where you can find salvation by which we must be saved except the name of Jesus. Verse 14 says, they could say nothing against it. Lessons to be learned. One, Peter and John continued the work of Jesus. Peter and John continued the work of Jesus. They extended the right arm of the gospel to the layman. Remember we read chapter 3 verse 7. He took him by the right hand and he lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Friends, today we are called, everyone, every one of us is called to extend our right arm, to extend our right hand to those who are in need. There are many people who are crying out for help and they are waiting for the right arm of the gospel to extend to them the invitation, come, 
lift them up so that they will stand up and be strengthened up again. This is the ministry of healing. This is what we call medical missionary work. And this is what we call today in modern terms comprehensive health outreach programs. Acts chapter 3 verse 11. It says, Now as the lame man who was healed, held on to Peter and John. What does this, what, what does this mean? This lame man was holding on to Peter and John. Why he held on to Peter and John? Parents, why your children hold on to your hand? It's because they trust in you. The lame man held on to Peter and John. Why? Because he trusted in them. The needs were satisfied and he trusted in them. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good work and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You are the light of the world. You are the one who is called to be the right arm of the gospel, reaching out to those who are in need of help and raise them up and they will hold on to you. They will hold on to you and say, thank you. Ministry of Healing 143, I believe many of us can memorize. But before the famous quote, it says, the world needs today what it needed 1900 years ago. Of course, that was written 100 plus years ago. So we can rephrase it and say, this, the world needs today what it needed 2000 years ago. What it was? A revelation of Christ. And then we read, we memorize this and says, Christ's method alone will give the success, the true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with the man, with men as one who desired their good and he showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, won their confidence, and he bade them, follow me. Win the confidence of men. And that is the purpose of the right arm of the gospel. Lesson number two, the priests and the Sadducees could say nothing against it. What does it mean? They could say nothing against it. As Adventists, we have this, some terminology that we always use. We say the right arm of the gospel is they entering which? Yeah, you know, entering which, a very interesting term. Uh, yes, you know, you can illustrate it by you know, a big hard rock and you know, how to break it. Okay, it's first you chip a wedge, then you, you put in the, the, the a wedge and then you hit it hard so that it will split. Right arm of the gospel is the entering wedge because the answer is even the most prejudiced person could say nothing against it. Friends, when you go around doing good, even the most prejudiced person can say nothing against you. You see how beautiful what God has planned for our church? Beautiful things in the Word of God, waiting for us to discover, not just discover, but to go and work. Okay, so lesson number three. Okay, we have read Acts 4, how Peter was filled with the Holy Ghost and he started telling you know, uh, the elders of the church at that time about what they had done. Okay, I'd like to highlight verse 9 and 12. Okay, it says, If we this day be examined for the good deeds done to this important man, by what means he is made whole, then it says in verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Okay, just like to highlight the two things here. Verse 9, the last word says whole, isn't it? Okay? And the Greek word there is sozo. 
Alright? And verse 12, the last verse, uh, the last word there is translated as save. And it's from the Greek word sozo. So you can see the word that's translated whole there and the save there is actually from the same word. Sozo. So one word described both things, to heal and to make whole, was the same word as to save. In fact, it's the same word that is translated as uh, salvation. Uh, it's called soteria. It's actually uh, coming from the root sozo. Sozo, one word described two things, to make a person whole or to save, to heal and to save. So closely are these related that one word describes both the ministry to the body and to the soul. They are one and united. And this is what God intends them to be. Evangelism 122, it says, the union of Christ-like work for the body and Christ-like work for the soul is the true interpretation of the gospel. Union of Christ-like work for the body and Christ-like work for the soul is the true interpretation of the gospel. Christ's work is our work today. Christ's work was to make man whole, physically, mentally, socially, emotionally, spiritually, and all aspects, basically. All aspects of a human life. That is what heaven is interested in. The restoration of the whole human race. Restoration of the whole human race. If it is Christ's work, it is our work to make man whole at all aspects of a human life. To make man whole. Physically, mentally, socially, emotionally, spiritually. Ministry of Healing, the first chapter is entitled Our Example. Uplifting Christ as our example. Jesus' work was to come to this world to heal and to restore. If Jesus is our example, then his work is our work. And as long as he was on this earth, he said, he was the light of the world. So today, as long as we are on this earth, we are called to do the same work, to be the light of the world. The order from Jesus remains the same. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good work so that your Father in heaven will be glorified. We are called to be the light of the world. Ministry of Healing 143, we are familiar. Just two pages, you just flip over, you find a very interesting quotation, what Ellen White said. She said, Many have no faith in God and have lost confidence in men. Many have no faith in God and have lost confidence in men. Do you find this interesting? You know, you look around today, a lot of people going around and tell people, I'm a free thinker. <laughs> I, you know, this God business, yeah, maybe it's somewhere, but, uh, you know, it's irrelevant. Isn't it true? Many have no faith in God and have lost confidence in man. Huh, this one is even more obvious. Okay, can you trust another person? <laughs> okay. It's very sad, but uh, sometimes we can't even trust our fellow brother or sister, isn't it? But, it should not be. But it really describes the world that we are living in today. Many have no faith in God and have lost confidence in men. Forget about uh, politicians. <laughs> okay. But really, you know, we are so hurt. All of us are so hurt in this world that we don't know who uh, is the next person that we can trust. 
But very interesting, the next sentence say, but they appreciate acts of sympathy and helpfulness. You know, though we all cannot trust each other, but one thing we have in common, one thing we have in common, that is we all appreciate acts of sympathy and helpfulness. So as these people, as they see one with no inducement of earthly praise and compensation, compensation come into their homes, ministering to the sick, feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, comforting the sad, and pointing, tenderly pointing all to him whose love and pity the human worker is but a messenger. As they see this, as they see this, their hearts are touched. Gratitude springs up. Gratitude springs up. Again, as they see this, their hearts are touched. Gratitude springs up. Faith is kindled. And they see that God cares for them. And they are prepared to listen as His word is open. Look at the top again. Many have no faith in God and have lost confidence in men. But look at that bottom there again. Gratitude springs up. Faith is kindled. Faith is rekindled. And they see God cares for them and they are prepared to listen. Again, meditate upon it again. Many have no faith in God and have lost confidence in men. But now, instead of loss of confidence, now confidence is restored and gratitude springs up. Instead of no, more, no faith in God, now faith is kindled. And they could see that God still cares for them. How could they realize that God still cares for them? Unless we do the work as Jesus did when he was on this earth. Lastly, Revelation chapter 21 verse 6. Looking into the future, God the creator of this world and humanity declared, Behold, I make all things new. As Adventists, we know the end is at hand. Soon the last diseased person will be healed and soon the last sin sick soul will be redeemed and the last tear drop for brokenness is wiped away. And we will behold all things are made new again. If we have that hope, then until then, may we all be found faithful in bringing the healing balm to this old sinful world. Hence, continue, brothers and sisters, continue in this good work Completing it, complete the last race, complete this last journey in the healing ministry of Christ. That's my appeal to you and to myself as we live in the last period of this world's history. Thank you.